Finally, we have Congressman Bill Gray. He was the highest ranking African American to serve in the United States Congress. Born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, he graduated from Franklin Marshall College with a degree in, with a degree in history in 1963. He received his Master's of Divinity from Drew University in 1986 and an MA in Church History from Princeton University in 1970. He was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1978 from Pennsylvania's 2nd Congressional District and was an active member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Gray became the chair of the Democratic Caucus and the Democratic Party Whip. He was the first African American chair of the Budget Committee. He wrote legislation that led to impose economic sanctions on South Africa in 1985 and in 1986. Resigning from Congress in 1991, Gray was appointed as the president and CEO of the United Negro College Fund and served until 2004. Following a 24-day hunger strike by trans-Africans Randall Robinson, Gray led the Congressional Black Caucus Task Force to Haiti in 1994. As the recipient, recipient of FDR's Freedom of Worship Medal, Gray has been consistently listed as one of Ebony's 100 most influential Americans. He is currently the vice chair of the Pet Commission on Children and Foster Care. With that said, I'd like to invite our panelists to come up and give any introductory remarks that they would like on this panel. I'll start with Congressman Bill Gray. <laughs> the question I said was, do I have to? Uh, it's very dangerous, you know. Ex-politician, uh, retired Baptist preacher who isn't preaching anymore, and a retired college professor. So for the next three or four hours, I'd like to conduct a symposium. <laughs> I'm just delighted to be here with uh, the distinguished panelists who are here. Uh, I leaned over and uh, whispered uh, to Kurt Smoke uh, when she said, Howard University Law School, uh, where he wished he had gone. <laughs> Uh, but I'm a great admirer of Kurt and, of course, a colleague uh, who worked with the Black Caucus and many of the Black Caucus members. I'm delighted to be with her, too. Uh, I think that if you look back and look at 1980s and what we call the Reagan years, they were probably the most formative years, in my opinion, for the Congressional Black Caucus. Formative in the sense that prior to that period, the Black Caucus had been generally a group of about five to 10, got up to about 12, 14 African-American members who saw themselves as spokespersons, not only for their congressional district, uh, but for all African-Americans in the United States. And so we often was, we were characterized as a civil rights group. Uh, in the 1980s, I think we evolved into what I call a broader reach and a broader perspective uh, in not only terms of representation of the needs of African Americans, but we expanded to about uh, 23 uh, members, and we started to move into areas uh, like uh, the budget of the United States, uh, a heavy involvement in foreign policy, especially in those areas where uh, U.S. foreign policy had been negligent and uh, those areas had been forgotten. And so I would describe the Reagan years as a formative period at a transition period where the Congressional Black Caucus uh, moved beyond its original uh, definition of representing the interests of African Americans, but also getting involved in economic issues and also foreign policy issues, but also bringing a unique perspective of the African American experience. And so that is, those are my few short comments. <laughs> Um, just to kind of uh, start the dialogue, I wanted to know if the panelists could shed some light on some of the most important advancements for CBC members or the Congressional Black Caucus during this era. Well, I'll, I'll take a shot uh, because I, I said it was a watershed. Mm -hmm. Before the 80s, the caucus was primarily a group, a small group of African American members, usually out of the civil rights era. Uh, they were civil rights leaders or labor leaders of some kind. Not too many of them had prior elected experience. Uh, in the 1980s, 
you suddenly see the uh, caucus doing things like uh, the only group and the first group to offer a budget alternative mm -hmm. to Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, in his first State of the Union speech, uh, laid out a budget that cut $50 billion of the deficit, and he said, if anybody else has got a plan, show it. The only group that year to show it was the Congressional Black Caucus, led by Walter Fauntleroy, who was, at that time, uh, chairman of the Black Caucus. We presented an alternative uh, budget, and every year since then, in fact, they still do it today, present an alternative uh, budget. Uh, and that got the caucus involved in economic issues of, of a large scale. Secondly, in that proposal was a whole set of reforms on taxes. Uh, Charlie Rangel led that, uh, and all of them were rejected. It's too liberal to, you know, way out there. But by 1998, Ronald Reagan had adopted 80% of all those recommendations and included them in his later budgets, uh, closing loopholes for upper income people to get more revenue to lower deficits and keep funding, fighting for uh, programs like the ones that, uh, Mayor Smoke uh, talked about. Uh, we ended up fighting for programs. They weren't necessarily black. Now, they were disproportionately black. For instance, Pell Grants, uh, disproportionately. Blacks represent 10% of America, or 12% now. We make up about 30% of the Pell Grants. So 70% of Pell Grant recipients are white. Uh, Ronald Reagan wanted to zero that program out in three years. Uh, we said, not on your life, and led the fight to increase it by inflation, as well as the urban programs like uh, UDAG and other urban mass transit, et cetera. Uh, and then you take defense. Uh, under Ron Dellum's leadership, who eventually became chairman of the defense committee in the early 90s, uh, you know, everybody thought Ron was crazy. You know, he's from uh, Berkeley, California, as Ron would say, berserkly. And uh, <laughs> he became a real expert on defense. And Ron was the first one to oppose the MX uh, missile, the B-1 bomber. Uh, laid out strategic reasons why, and by the late 1980s, guess what? Reagan and adopted the position of forget the MX, uh, forget the B-1. Uh, and so, you know, in military, and then in foreign policy, there were a number of issues. Uh, Merv Dinelli led the Congressional Black Caucus on Reagan's Caribbean Initiative, which he introduced in the early 1980s, and Merv Dinelli led the caucus to build a coalition with Hispanic members and other members from states like California, Texas, Florida, and New Mexico, you know what they all have in common, large Hispanic voting populations, and altered that initiative to include uh, some very important programs for the Caribbean states, okay? And, uh, and of course, the really piece de resistance was South Africa. Uh, the Black Caucus, uh, going back into the 60s when they were formed, had introduced legislation to put sanctions on South Africa. Uh, they went nowhere uh, until the 1980s uh, when Reagan came out with constructive engagement, which was just a uh, policy of embracing apartheid and hoping that it was going to evolve into majority rule. Uh, it was the Congressional Black Caucus uh, that came up with the push to impose uh, sanctions on South Africa and the job got done by 1986. We imposed sanctions with an overwhelming vote in the House, a vote that was more than two-thirds, which sent the signal through Reagan that uh, you're going to get an uh, override of a veto. And that led the Senate uh, to uh, modify the House bill and come back with sanctions. And so for the first time in modern American history, a president's foreign policy was overturned by the Congress, led by the Congressional Black Caucus. He vetoed it, it came back, and we overrode the veto. That has never been done since World War II in this country for any president, Democrat or Republican. So those are just some of the things and some of the caucus members who were involved in, in doing those things, and they were broader uh, than the black community. Uh, equity and right priorities in the midst of deficit reduction is not just a black folks discussion. Uh, whereas it was, if you think about it, what were black folk and 
uh, some white folks beginning to talk about in the 1960s. They were talking about poor people. Martin Luther King got killed, not in the Civil Rights March, but an economic rights march. Civil rights had moved to economic rights, the Poor People's March. And here you have, uh, 20 years later, the budget of the House of Representatives being controlled by a black guy, a preacher from Philadelphia. Do any of you want to I just wanted to add uh, the important comment about this move from uh, civil rights to uh, economic rights. I think it was a, just a redefining mm -hmm. of what civil rights was, was all about. And uh, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus certainly was the leader there. Um, and this issue of, of contracting was very important. The Black Caucus took the lead at the federal level, but then it set a model that was adopted by states around the country and cities, so the, it really had an impact on uh, improving the prospects for uh, a black, the black business community. And the black business community, of course, did hire an awful lot of, uh, uh, of African American uh, employees. But one other singular accomplishment for the, the caucus uh, was the uh, making sure that the Voting Rights Act uh, was reauthorized. Mm -hmm. There are uh, several times that there is an attempt to say, okay, it's over, we don't need the Voting Rights Act anymore, and yet every time uh, that uh, uh, it came up for reauthorization, the Congressional Black Caucus was there because they recognized that there were still so many shenanigans that were being played out there in terms of constricting the rights of folks to vote, and so it is a major accomplishment that the Voting Rights Act still remains on the books today. And let me just add to what Kurt said because uh, we don't recognize real accomplishment until people are gone. But Perrin Mitchell, who was the leader of the caucus on what we call the Minority Set-Aside Program, uh, that was an unbelievable attempt and leadership by him, which basically said that every time you spend a dollar, you got to make sure that uh, minorities uh, are included in the contracting. And in a sense, it was black, but it wasn't. Actually, the, ben the biggest beneficiaries of the Minority Center Pro Set Aside Program have been white women. Right. Just like the Civil Rights Movement today. You know, the, the biggest beneficiaries of the Civil Rights Movements of the 60s have been white women. If you look at the statistics, whether it's corporate executives or anywhere else. And Perrin Mitchell was the lead person on that. And then with John Conyers uh, in the 1980s, uh, Conyers took a piece of report language that I had in appropriation and then turned it into law that it applied to the biggest budget of all, defense. Mm -hmm. And so Perry Mitchell's legacy was not just for small business administration, but it ended up in the 1980s under John Conyers' leadership uh, being for the whole defense budget, which was $500 uh, billion. And, and so uh, the, the broadening impact uh, of people like Perrin Mitchell and his vision uh, and its impact uh, not just on African Americans uh, is just astounding. Well, we definitely want to make sure that the audience is able to ask questions, so I believe that you all have index cards or, oh, we have a couple of questions, so I'll take those. The silence of the CBC has been, oh, excuse me, Defeating, defeated with regard to the revision of history, especially with regard to the glorification of the Reagan years. Why has the CBC been quiet or absent in this debate, given that the negative role, the reg negative role that Reagan played in the liberation of countries like South Africa? Uh, you know, Reagan and I had the interface with him on a daily basis. As chairman of the budget committee, uh, I had to uh, oppose his budgets, his priorities, and every month he had me down at the White House for breakfast and lunch, you know, uh, just the two of us uh, with his chief of staff and the budget chairman from the Senate who was Republican, uh, Pete Domenici. Uh, from a human standpoint, he was very interesting, entertaining, and um, engaging personality. But from a policy standpoint, and particularly if you were coming from an African-American standpoint, he was an absolute disaster. <laughs> and, and Kurt just reminded me of a story uh, about him, uh, which 
you know, reminds me of other stories that I had in my experience. Like one day we were meeting with him and he was arguing for a big foreign affairs uh, budget. I was on the foreign affairs uh, committee. And uh, he talked about one day when I was flying down to Camp David, I looked out the helicopter and I saw all these cattle ponds. He said, you know what cattle ponds are? Those are government subsidized watering holes for cattle. Everybody looked at each other. <laughs> Kurt, you know, we went, huh? <laughs> Cattle ponds between here and Camp David? <laughs> no, he's confusing cattle ponds in California, <laughs> not here. Uh, I mean, he had lapses, which now we now know that he had a <laughs> medical problem. Uh, Sam Pierce, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I had almost forgotten that one. Yeah. Another one was um, uh, that he did. Uh, and his and the press and the, and his senate and his cabinet members would always defend him. I was on a show uh, with a former ambassador to the UN. Uh, his ambassador, I can't think of her name right now, uh, but she was a very sharp-tongued lady. And um, Kurt Patrick, that's it. Thank you. And uh, uh, they asked me about some of my battles with him, and I said I had great respect for him. I said, but I just didn't agree with 99% of what he stood for. Uh, you know, ketchup as a vegetable, uh, elimination of Pell Grants for the poorest people in America to go to college, and I started ticking it off, and she got very, you know, upset about it, because this was the deification of Reagan after he died, and um, I told a story about how I was in the private dining room with him one day, along with Pete Domenici and um, his chief of staff, just the four of us upstairs in the personal dining room, not even the big one, the little one. Uh, having lunch, and he was going to convince me that I should accept his budget. And uh, we had a great time before we got to talking policy. And once we got to talking policy, it got nasty. And to start the, the luncheon off, he had to pull out three by five cards and read them and welcome John Sununu, his chief of staff, <laughs> Pete Domenici, Republican chairman, and me there. <laughs> And I just thought it was strange that I mentioned that. And, and uh, the UN ambassador said, oh, well, all foreign ministers read that. And then I realized the man had just died the day before. And I didn't really want to step on him and say, hey, his chief of staff, the Republican chair of the budget committee. I said, I could see if he pulled out a card and said, Bill Gray, it's good to see you. But he had to read the card for everybody. And then the rest of the meeting, he's, he didn't say a thing. It was really an argument between Pete Domenici and uh, his chief of staff, you know, attacking me for disagreeing with their budget priorities and trying to persuade me that I ought to, you know, give in. And I basically told them, no, you know, that's not going to happen. And, you know, they said, well, what about it? Not going to happen. What about it? Not going to happen. And uh, so he, I think he was suffering from some dementia uh, long before it was publicly acknowledged and maybe even into at least the second term of his presidency. And, and you yeah. reminded me of that, Kurt. You know, and on that, that question, though, I don't know that the caucus as a group or its members have been silent about uh, Reagan. Uh, one of the things that it reminds me of is the fact that when the caucus does it or produces its alternative budget, it just doesn't get the same kind of publicity mm -hmm. that uh, <laughs> the other... Uh, so, so that even when their voices are raised, um, that uh, it's hard to get through, uh, you know, the Fox News or uh, or even get, uh, you know, uh, other uh, channels to, to focus in on it because it's the Black Caucus is speaking with a different voice. Mm -hmm. It is coming to a different approach. It's saying, hey, let's look at it uh, from a different perspective. And it's uh, usually also I find that. Um, the uh, reports uh, from the caucus aren't easily reduced to uh, three-second sound bites. Um, they're saying this is more complicated uh, than that. Reagan's image, I mean, you've now put an airport in his name and all that uh, sort of stuff, but really what he did to cities was not very, uh, uh, is not worth uh, your adulation. That's a tough sell. So I, I think 
the, that the caucus has raised its voice individually and collectively, but it's just been very difficult to get through uh, yeah. uh, the, 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 the controllers of the media. I think you're absolutely right. The caucus challenged him for every step of the way during his eight years of presidency. It was not always covered, but when you reverse a president's foreign policy, when you reverse his defense policy, okay, when you reverse his civil rights policy by renewing the Voting Rights Act when he and his party was against that, okay? Uh, when you change budget priorities and say ketchup is not a vegetable, you're not gonna close down Pell Grants for the poorest kids in America, white and black, to get an education. I don't know what else you're doing. You, you basically are taking a baseball bat mm -hmm. and busting him inside his head. That's right. That's right. And he's bleeding. Now, the problem is, Kurt Smoke says, is sometimes the media doesn't cover it. I, you know, and, and, and why? Because we are who we are. I mean, um, I'll be candid about it. I remember when I was on, I was doing a television show in September of uh, 1984. I had been vice chairman of the Black Caucus, secretary of the caucus. Uh, I had been head of the steering and policy, which is your freshman class. And two reporters said, Mr. Gray, what are you going to do next? And I didn't say I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> I said, I think I'm going to run for chairman of the budget committee. They both broke out laughing on national television. Four months later, I was the budget chair. Mm. <laughs> and, and, and as my colleague here said, uh, I mean, it was a team effort. You know, uh, the Black Caucus, the staff, all lobbying, knocking on doors. Uh, but they just didn't believe it. In fact, in when I got elected, which was the first week of December, here was a black liberal, okay, who had only been in Congress six years, was gonna be chairman of the budget committee, dealing with economic policy, not civil rights. Right. Uh, the press wrote, they could not believe I won the election, uh, so what they wrote was I won because Tip O'Neill wanted me to win. <laughs> and Tip O'Neill never lifted a finger. <laughs> You know, but they, that, if you go back and dig out the press, how did this guy do it? He had the secret support of Tip O'Neill. And Tip O'Neill stayed out of the race. It was three people running, Leon Panetta, uh, Bill Gray, and a guy named Jim Jones, who was the previous chairman from Oklahoma, who later became ambassador in Mexico. But the, it was the kind of work in pulling together, <laughs> as my colleague here talked about, where congressional staff, members of the CBC were knocking on doors and taking names and <laughs> twisting arms. The, um, the perception of the CBC being silent is a great segue to the next question. Um, it's to any panelists and it says, please address the perception that with the exception of one or two, the CBC members are seen as less progressive and less aggressive than members during the 70s and the 80s. Um, if you can speak to this phenomenon or this idea, we'd appreciate it. Well, first of all, I don't think that's, a, that's not quite accurate. Okay. I'll start by saying that. First of all, I talked about those 650,000 constituents and the people who elect you. When you come to Washington, your first priority is to represent your constituents. And then you find common ground where you can work for the, for the good of everybody. Now, since I came to work in the Congress or to, and to Washington, D.C., I don't think the CBC has ever been silent or less aggressive than anything. Sometimes you have to bring common interests together. You had members, let's say in the 70s, the early CBC members, were largely from large urban areas. Mm -hmm. Then when you had, the, with the Voting Rights Act and the increase in CBC members, you had members from rural areas, rural districts. So you had to, they had to deal with their constituents and then deal with the expectation that the rest of America had that they represented every black person in America. And then there's the press. You had cases where, like um, Congressman Gray said, when Mervyn Dimely worked on the Caribbean Basin Initiative, they were fighting the NRA to get all these guns off the street. That didn't just happen. That goes back to the 80s. The CBC is always doing several things. I've worked on 
and organized two get out the vote bus tours where CBC members are spread across the country in other people's districts during the election phase, trying to get other people elected who share their basic values. So I, th I think we can't always believe what we see on the surface, and we can't trust the press or the media to report the positive things that CBC members are doing, or any black people for that matter. We have to do our work, our research, and we have to listen and find out a few things for ourselves. Can I, I just want to build on what uh, Ms. Jackson was saying, because I understand that that question, uh, and I used to hear it uh, when I was a, a local elected official, how come they're not out there the way they were, you know, uh, beating down the rafters? But just think about, uh, th this is really more a perception issue than, than reality. When uh, uh, Congressman Gray talked about Ron Dellums, Ron Dellums came into uh, Congress, he's a, a fire-breathing, uh, tough, you know, got to knock down the rafters um, a person, beating up on folks. He, he was trying to give voice. His only power when he first came in was voice. All of a sudden, each year, he's starting to get more seniority. So Ron Dellums, who becomes chairman of a committee, has got to act in a very different way than Ron Dellums, who was a freshman not being heard uh, by, uh, by the others in power. He can affect policy, though, he can affect our lives, he can affect the whole uh, fate of this country in a way that uh, is extraordinarily powerful as the chairman of that committee, but he can't be the, he can't uh, operate in, in the same way. So I could see how somebody could get the, the, the impression that he, he's not as tough, he's not doing uh, what he did uh, before. He's actually doing more, exactly. and he's doing it better and he's being uh, more effective. And so in a certain extent, it is the success of the caucus in growing, in, in staying in there as long as they have, and rising up in leadership positions that has really had a tremendous uh, impact. And, and, and just because you don't see somebody's face on TV, don't think that they're not operating in a very powerful and effective way in the Congress. Uh, earlier. <laughs> Earlier, Congressman Gray um, referred to the 80s being a, a time of very of critical formative years. Mm -hmm. And with any formative years and any growth and expansion comes growing pains. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if the panelists can speak to what some of those growing pains were during this period and what we can learn from them today. Sure. Uh, it goes back to what Curtis said and also uh, Sister Jackson here about what I call diversity. You know, black people don't all look alike, walk alike, and talk alike, even though some folks think we do. <laughs> and some folks think we ought to, even within our own community. I disagree with that. We don't. Black folk from Mississippi are different from black folk from Detroit. They're both black, they both are victimized by racism and segregation, but they are different. And what happened going back to the 60s and 70s when the 13 started the Black Caucus. Uh, they were civil rights leaders. Bill Clay, Lou Stokes, most of them did not have legislative experience except Gus Hawkins, okay? Uh, uh, Charlie Diggs had gotten his legislative experience in the Congress being there so long. And so they tended to have to yell, shout, hold press conference and, you know, take the absurd position. But as they gained power, they exercised that power and got things done. But there were differences. In the 80s, the caucus suddenly moved from 10, 11, up into the 20s. Now it's over 40. They come from North Carolina. When I was there, there was, uh, Mike Epsi came in the late 80s uh, from rural Mississippi. Uh, Mickey Leland came from urban Texas, Houston, okay? And Young had come from urban South Atlanta. Urban South is not rural South. Mm -hmm. And don't make that mistake, okay? Um, and so we really didn't have the diversity until about the late 80s and the 90s, and now it's really broad based. You have people who don't represent urban district, but represent, you take Sanford Bishop, 
Now, Sanford Bishop from Georgia won his race this past year by one fifth, no, one half of, of percent. In fact, I went to bed thinking he had lost, okay? And his district is 60% rural. I'm talking about rural Georgia, y'all. He has Columbus, okay, but it is a small city, about 150,000. He wins that by a landslide. The problem is what Kurtz is, when he comes, he has a different point of view about agricultural programs. All of us guys from urban districts, eh, cut the heck out of those urban <laughs> agricultural programs, throw them away. He can't do that. Benny Thompson can't do that. Mike Espy couldn't do that. And we used to almost have conflicts and fights in the caucus, being very candid here. Uh, you know, I'm old, you know, they're just talking <laughs> up the mental laps. Uh, between members of the caucus on policy issues because southern rural members in the late 80s before I left, in the early 90s, took different points of view on issues that the majority of caucus thought were anathema. You know, you believe in a constitutional amendment for a balanced budget? How dare you? You believe in uh, gun rights? Whereas most of the caucus was trying to get rid of, get rid of firearms. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you know you, if you've ever been in the South, you know, and I was born in the South, but I go back a lot, you know, it's not just white folks drive around in them pickup trucks with the little doggy and the gun rack, but black folks do. In fact, black folks will tell you they got that gun there to protect themselves <laughs> against other folk. You know, hint, hint, you interpret it. So, you know, you had these black congressmen who suddenly came who were for the NRA. Uh, you know, like, oh boy, we'd have some knock down, drag out <laughs> arguments and fights. And so finally, I just simply, I, I, you know, I, I had to say to, to some caucus members one day, look, he has to represent his district. If that's what he thinks is the right thing to do, after seeing all the evidence, that's what he's got to do. And so I think uh, Sister Jackson and uh, Kurt hit on it in different ways about uh, caucus members. We even had caucus members when I was there, when we had a little over 20 members, eight of them represented majority white districts. Majority white districts. Alan Wheat was right. one. Uh, Harold Ford, senior, mm -hmm. when he first came. His district was majority white. And so therefore, you know, my district was 80% black, Philadelphia. You know, and so therefore, the representation becomes a little bit different, and therefore, the impact that you have is different, because you could, by the 1980s, 1990s, a news reporter could say, Kurt Smoke, what do you believe? And they always looked at Kurt Black first, mayor second, and then they'll go to somebody else Black and say, what do you believe? But he's not the mayor mm -hmm. of a northern or middle Atlantic city. He's the mayor of uh, uh, Pritchard, Alabama. And so his view might be totally different on some subjects that is. And, and so we've gained, we've gained over 40 black members of the caucus, but we've gained a rich, and I call it rich, diversity of viewpoints, uh, which I don't think weakens the caucus. I think it ultimately strengthens because you really, argue and get down to the core of what's really important. I'm sorry it takes so long. It's okay. Um, I just wanted to say something else about the caucus and the growing pains in the 80s. Uh, John, and this goes back to the question about the caucus being silent. John Conyers, who, was a who still is a member from Detroit, had risen to chairman of the crime subcommittee on the House Judiciary Committee. In New York, there were reports of serious cases of police brutality and a lot of people getting uh, killed by police in nonviolent events. John Conyers started a committee called the International Harlem Renaissance Committee. And he said he called the committee that because Harlem was the, ca was the capital of the world for all black people. And this committee met with volunteers, some staffers, in the basement of churches in New York City. 
and John Conyers called in the people to hear their stories about the brutality. He, had, he used his position at, on the crime subcommittee to have a hearing, and people were wrapped around an armory for blocks in Manhattan on that day to come into John Conyers and that committee and tell their story. Well, as a result of those hearings, New York City got their first black police commissioner. Mm -hmm. And that is not in any history books, was never in the papers, but I always tell people John Conyers was responsible for that. John Conyers also gathered up a group of us staffers and anybody else who would come when Harold Washington was running for mayor of Chicago. You had to call your relatives all over the country who were in Chicago to vote for Harold Washington. You had to um, get on a bus or whatever mode of transportation and get into Chicago and knock, knock on doors and ring bells with Conyers. Well, what happened, Harold Washington was elected the first black mayor of Chicago. And a third project he had was getting the Martin Luther King holiday bill. And that was another thing. He said, are these white senators and white congressmen who are not voting for it, if you have members of your family living in the South, get them together and tell them to write these people and call these people and tell them you're not voting for them anymore if they don't vote for the bill. So I just tell these little stories to say, there, and, and that's only a few cases that I personally know. I'm sure there are a multitude of others that people aren't telling. I remember there one last thing I want to say, and this is since Congressman Payne just came in and he's mm -hmm. the chairman of the foundation. There were, was a family of children who had been adopted in New Jersey. It wasn't his district, but it was in his state. One of the kids escaped. They were eating paint. They were, it was a horrible story. They could barely survive. So in the papers, what they were asking you to do was send a donation to some bank and they were going to give, I don't know what they planned to do with the money, but Congressman Payne got letters and he actually took action against those adoptive parents to make tougher rules to adopt kids. Anyway, it was a lot deeper than just sending a donation. And I never read any of this in the paper. I just happened to be working for Congressman Payne at the time. So there is a whole lot of work being done by lots of members of the CBC, former members of the CBC who are still working and speaking out for our people that the media does not have any interest in reporting. Thank you. Just to wrap things up, I want to ask the panelists to kind of give a very brief um, idea or your sentiments on what we can take, leaders today, what we can take from the 80s um, to help us foster <coughs> progress. So well, I guess I'll start I on this end. Can I just say one thing that uh, you've heard from both Ms. Jackson and uh, Congressman Gray is that you have to be uh, willing to transform your organization. I mean, the Congressional Black Caucus mm -hmm. started as one type of organization and responded to uh, uh, the circumstances of the 80s, transformed itself, strengthened itself, and now uh, I believe is viewed as not only a, a national treasure, but an international organization with an impact on human rights uh, around the world. 